Um, so thank you for inviting me. I agree. Adam's talk, that was really, really remarkable. Uh, very exciting. Um, I'm going to do something, uh, as Monty Python says, completely different, which is I'm going to tell a story. And we all know about the pitfalls of, of anecdotes when it comes to science. But I think my story will really animate some of the broader uh, research findings that have been discussed by other um, participants in this workshop, um, in including Dr. Barrow, Dr. Schmidt, Dr. Michaels, and Dr. Uh, Hernandez. Um, and I'm going to tell a story about sponsor influence and in diabetes research. Um, uh, and it's a, a case study of the uh, American Beverage Association. Um, my disclosures, I receive uh, federal funding from the NIH to direct a Center for Diabetes Translational Research. Uh, I'm the recipient of an R01 grant from the NIH to evaluate the effects of the sugar sweetened beverage tax in the San Francisco Bay Area on population level consumption, uh, where we also project the population health impacts of that reduced consumption. Uh, I also received CDC funding to evaluate the effects of the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program of the USDA on diabetes outcomes. And in the past, I have received California Department of Public Health and CDC funding to direct the California Diabetes Prevention and Control Program. Uh, I am a primary care physician at San Francisco General Hospital, but also uh, do public health work. And in that capacity, I was asked to serve as a scientific expert to the Federal Ninth Circuit Court in the defense of a case involving the American Beverage Association versus the city and county of San Francisco related to a billboard warning or ordinance that the city of San Francisco um, was attempting to implement back in 2015. And that will be one of the subjects of my story. And the story will touch on a number of uh, issues that have been discussed uh, by other speakers, um, including, of course, the influence of industry in affecting uh, science, but more importantly, the sort of consequences of that influence as it relates to public policy and the ways in which our own scientific institutions may become uh, harnessed and hijacked by industry in the process of uh, disseminating their science. So the prologue to this story, of course, is the diabetes epidemic. Uh, and this is an epidemic globally now, which affects uh, in 2015 over 400 million people, but is projected in 2040 uh, to affect uh, eight, uh, about 8% 8 of the entire uh, global population. Uh, this has, um, epidemic has increased rapidly across a number of measures of diabetes from incidence to mortality uh, across income levels uh, on a global scale, from low income to high income uh, countries, the rate of rise of the diabetes epidemic has been uh, inexorable. However, there has been some promising uh, recent data coming out of the United States. Um, here, uh, I graph in red the uh, annual consumption of sugar-sweetened beverages in gallons per year over the last uh, 60 or 70 years in red. And as you'll see, the consumption rates peaked at about uh, 2000. And as you'll see, the diabetes prevalence rates in dark blue uh, were rising uh, sort of in lockstep at about a 15 year uh, delay from the increases in sugar sweetened beverage consumption. However, um, as you'll see, in about 2010, we see the diabetes prevalence rates flattening out uh, about 15 years after the consumption of sugar-sweetened beverages started to decline in the United States because of changes in social norms related to some of the science coming out around sugar-sweetened beverage consumption. And more importantly, the diabetes incidence rates, the cases of new diabetes, began to plummet again about 10 or 15 years after the drop in sugar-sweetened beverage consumption. So this may represent the beginnings of a very important public health turnaround that would be very critical to uh, harness and leverage uh, to a greater degree in the United States and of course in the global context as well. So in that context, uh, I'll start the story with chapter one, which was about the court case. Uh, now, as you all know, the sugar sweetened beverage industry has been very effective in marketing their products. Uh, tens of billions of dollars per year are spent on marketing their products. This is the, um, the, world, the recent World Cup uh, uh, ploy to uh, to get this um, this puppet, um, which somehow represents uh, the Middle East, 
uh, to be aligned with uh, Coca-Cola, and Coca-Cola is everywhere in uh, this year's um, World Cup. Now, um, there has been a discussion recently about whether or not advertisements and billboards for sugar-sweetened beverages should be accompanied by warning notices, such as the one I show here. And this really is the beginning of the story I'm about to tell. So um, in 2014, the city and county of San Francisco passed an ordinance that would require billboards, which are of course posted on public uh, grounds, um, billboards are rented from the city and county, would require billboards advertising sugar sweetened beverages to contain this warning that drinking beverages can contribute, these beverages can contribute to obesity, diabetes, and tooth decay. Uh, and I served as um, the expert witness uh, on this case. Um, and wrote a uh, short paper describing the ways in which both science and public health were on trial in this case, and described the ways in which the American Beverage Association was uh, using science to cast doubt on the relationship between their product and obesity, diabetes, and tooth decay. Now, um, I will say that, um, uh, we all have to remind ourselves that the scientific endeavor um, is an attempt to combine unbiased experimentation with objective observations of the natural world so we can accumulate knowledge that can help us approximate truth. We can never really determine truth through science. We can only, only get closer and closer to what we believe is the truth. And in that regard, this case entirely revolved around science and the nature of truth. In the hearing and the expert reports submitted by industry, the focus, in fact, was on the scientific veracity of the warning. Industry argued that it was unconstitutional for their so-called commercial free speech to be infringed or chilled by having to include compelled non-commercial speech in the form of a warning, particularly when this compelled speech is quote unquote misleading false or a subject of scientific controversy. Here, industry cited numerous scientific studies to support its claims of the falsehood of the relationship between sugar-sweetened beverages and disease, and to animate its claims of controversy. The city, uh, in part backed up from my scientific uh, expert uh, report, responded that the warning is factually true and that causal relationships, in fact, are supported by strong science. Now, the judge in this case issued an opinion after many weeks and months, and Judge Chen uh, stated that, quote, the compelled disclosure uh, must convey a, a fact rather than opinion. Generally speaking, it must be accurate. He's essentially saying that warning notices must be factual and accurate. He continued that the factual requirement should not, quote, be so easily manipulated that it would effectively bar any compelled disclosure by the government, particularly where public health and safety are at issue. He went on to write that, quote, controversy cannot automatically be deemed created anytime there is a disagreement about the science behind a warning, because science is almost always debatable at some level. He concluded in his decision and judgment that the sugar-sweetened beverage warning required by the ordinance likely passes the factual and accurate requirement. In this case, the city uh, won in, in defense of the ordinance its case, um, but the industry uh, won on appeal. Now, um, I will move on to chapter two, uh, relating to the question of competing conflicts of interest. And here I'm talking about what has been descri described as non-financial conflicts of interest. Uh, I was compelled by my research in preparing for the expert report for this case on the degree to which indeed, when one looked at the literature, there was controversy as to whether sugar-sweetened beverages are causal factors in the obesity and diabetes epidemics. And I went on to examine, uh, as Laura Schmidt has described, uh, the degree to which perhaps industry is behind this controversy. We carried out a systematic review of randomized controlled trials with outcomes related to markers of diabetes and obesity. 
as well as systematic reviews and meta-analyses that included causal studies and identified 60 studies over a 15-year period, 28 of them experimental and 32 of them systematic reviews or meta-analyses. And we asked the question, to what extent are funding of the studies or funding of the uh, support, financial support for the authors of studies associated with the outcomes of these studies? Um, we discovered that the beverage industry is heavily influencing scientific truth. Of the 60 studies, 26 articles found no associations between the product and the disease outcomes, and 34 articles described positive associations. 25 of the 26 negative studies, 96%, had funding ties to the industry, and one of 34 positive studies, 2.9%, had ties. The odds ratio uh, with respect to finding that sugar sweetened beverage industry was more likely to find no associations than independently funded studies was 32.7, which is a, a relative a risk. This is a relative risk, I'm sorry. Uh, very similar to that which Dr. Lisa Barrow found when she was looking at the effects of tobacco industry funding on uh, uh, study outcomes. We concluded that this industry appears to be manipulating the contemporary scientific process to create controversy and advance their business interests at the expense of the public's health. Now, this is just echoing what others have said with respect to prior science, and it's perhaps not surprising with uh, the exception of the size of the effect. Now, this study uh, garnered a lot of uh, press coverage, and um, the industry uh, responded in kind. I'll read to you the letter to the editor that was published in the Annals of Internal Medicine, written by Maya Jack, the Chief Science and Regulatory Officer of the American Beverage Association. She stated, Schillinger argued that research should be judged on its funding source, not its analytical rigor or scientific merit. Discrediting studies solely on the basis of funding source dis disservices scientific inquiry and casts unjustified judgments on the investigators producing them. Industry has an obligation to research its project product's efficacy, typically through interventional studies and safety. Dismissing industry-sponsored research on the basis of funding is no more valid than discarding studies funded by private foundations or groups that advocate for particularly po particular policy views. Transparent disclosure of conflicts of interest and of potential biases, as well as objective assessments of the research according to accepted scientific principles, is the proper approach to adequately vet the strengths of a study. Now, here's the, the puncher. She states, the authors should ask themselves whether they are totally committed to their point of view and unwilling to consider other perspectives. And finally, intellectually motivated biases are as important as financial conflicts of interest. Now, what are intellectual conflicts of interest? versus, and are they equal to financial conflicts of interest? This equivalency, I would argue, is dangerous and seems calculated to undermine the work of independent clinician investigators whose primary obligation is the health of our patients and our communities. This strategy goes uh, of calling out uh, investigators who are concerned about industry influence um, as having intellectual conflicts of interest goes back to the 1970s and 80s uh, and was a strategy of the tobacco industry. As Alan Brandt described in his paper, conflicts of interest, such as those invented by the tobacco industry, have the potential to undermine and corrupt the scientific enterprise in ways that do significant damage to what we know and how we deploy the knowledge, deploy the knowledge we possess. Let me move on now to chapter three of this story. Now that I've described the industry influence and their attempt to undermine my credibility, uh, and the credibility of our science by claiming that we were subject to an intellectual conflict of interest. Junk science in the media. Now, um, interestingly, this same uh, Annals of Internal Medicine journal, a few months after we published our systematic review, published a study in called The Scientific Basis of Guideline Recommendations on Sugar Intake. The conclusions of this study were that guidelines on dietary sugar, these are the ones that suggest that we limit our uh, sugar intake to five to 10% of um, daily calories. They concluded they do not meet criteria for trustworthy recommendations and are based on low quality evidence. 
public health officials when promulgating these recommendations and their public audiences when considering dietary behavior should be aware of these limitations. Uh, this was a study of 12 national and international guidelines uh, related to the limitation of added sugar intake. And their conclusions was that this, these guidelines are uh, a function of poor science. Uh, the primary funding source was the Technical Committee on Dietary Carbohydrates of the North American branch of the International Life Sciences Institute, ILSI, which Dr. Laura Schmidt described in her talk uh, a few minutes ago. Now, interestingly, I was asked to write an editorial on this study. Um, the title of our editorial was Guidelines to Limit Added Sugar Intake, Junk Science or Junk Food. Uh, in our editorial, we start out by saying that it is important to note that ILSI funded the review. ILSI, ILSI is a trade group representing the Coca-Cola Company, Dr. Pepper Snapple Group, the Hershey Company, Mars Inc., Nestle USA, and PepsiCo, among others. In essence, this study suggests that placing limits on junk food is based on junk science, a conclusion favorable to the food and beverage industry. Now, that funding was not enough to uh, critically appraise the study in an editorial. Um, rather, we had to look at the methods in detail. And our summary was that concerns about the funding source and methods of the review preclude us from accepting its conclusions that recommendations to limit added sugar consumption to less than 10% are not trustworthy. Policymakers, when confronted with claims that sugar guidelines are based on junk science, should consider whether junk food was the source. Now, what were the methods? Um, getting back to Adam's talk about can we use AI to determine uh, the industry's impact on uh, the quality of science? What were these methods that we uncovered when we analyzed in detail their study? Well, there were four methodologic flaws that were fatal flaws. The first was that authors used the inconsistency of international and national recommendations across time and across guidelines as a rationale to raise concern about the quality of these guidelines. However, guidelines were issued between 1995 and 2016 over a 20 year period. One would expect recommendations spanning more than two decades to evolve. The most recent guidelines from Public Health England, WHO, and the USDA showed, in fact, remarkable consistency, recommending limits ranging from less than 5 to less than 10% of daily calories from sugar intake. In fact, the only outlier was the 20, 2002 Institute of Medicine guideline that recommending no more than 25% of daily calories, which was partly funded, that report, by ILSI North America. Here is the National Academies Press uh, IOM report uh, on the 25% number and the funder, including ILSI. Now, the second critique was that, quite paradoxically, the systematic review that they uh, carried out considered the funding source to be a characteristic determining the trustworthiness of each guideline. And they described as, quote, unclear the funding of the dietary guidelines for Americans, which recommended limiting sugars to less than 10%. Uh, and therefore questions its, its editorial independence and gave it a poor score. This assessment was curious because the review's appendix in the Annals of Internal Medicine, in fact, acknowledged that the Dietary Guidelines of America is federally sponsored by the taxpayers and that advisory committee members were thoroughly vetted for conflicts per federal rules. Not only did they fail to describe that in their paper, but they did not even comment on the fact that the aforementioned IOM report of the 25% sugar guideline was in fact funded by ILSI. The third methodologic problem was that the report used the appraisal of guidelines for research and evaluation, agree to instrument, to assess the guideline quality. This selection was inappropriate and guaranteed ratings of poor quality of all of these national and international public health guidelines. Why is that? Because the agreed to tool is designed to assess clinical practice guidelines in the treatment of diseases at an individual patient level. It is not designed to assess the quality and appropriateness of dietary guidelines to assess risks of consumption at the population level. 
making their recommendations around uh, consumption, uh, grading their recommendations around consumption at a population health level using a tool that is used to assess uh, the efficacy of drugs in individual patients is inappropriate. As a result, by using these tools, the authors downgraded the trustworthiness of the guidelines because, for example, ways to limit sugar intake, quote, were not clearly presented and because likely barriers to and facilitators of implementation, implementation were not discussed. Agree to includes a measure of how easy is it to implement this guideline. And while it is not difficult to implement added sugar limitations uh, uh, in the population level, using the agreed tool allowed them to downgrade these guidelines as a result. They also created a de novo overall guideline quality score of one to seven with inter-rater differences of three points permitted, yet did not report the reliability of the score. And the fourth and final critique of their method was that authors used the grade system to evaluate the quality of evidence for the guidelines. This also was problematic. For example, authors falsely claimed that the food pattern modeling and national caloric data used to inform the US dietary guidelines were not publicly available, which prohibited them as authors from applying the grade to assess quality Quote, using the grade approach, we found that the overall quality of evidence to support recommendations was low to very low. Now, this critique was extremely puzzling because they ignored that the methods used in the DGA were actually described in detail in Appendixes E 3.7, together with an over 500 page supporting evidence report called a series of systematic reviews on the relationship between dietary patterns and health outcomes from the USDA's nutrition evidence library. In contrast, the authors of the report said that the USDA's report was two pages long, which of course was the executive summary. Now, all of this again is not very surprising, but what happened with this study and our accompanying editorial was that The Atlantic did a cover story on the sugar controversy. It was called The Limits of Sugar Guidelines. Is there a danger in governments offering too specific advice on sugar consumption? And here they describe the quote unquote controversy of the scientists who issued their report saying that the added sugar guidelines are nonsense. And then our editorial suggesting that their science was nonsense. Uh, as the topic of this article. Now, interestingly, in the course of doing their uh, article, they went and interviewed Dr. Christine Lane, who is the editor of Annals of Internal Medicine. They write, industry manipulation of the science is obviously an ongoing serious concern. It was in part why the editor-in-chief of Annals, Christine Lane, invited this editorial. She said, quote, I wanted to show both sides of the issue, she told me, although she said that she considered the editorial, that's my editorial, to be unusually, quote, strident and hostile for an academic journal. Indeed, Schillinger and Kearns, my co-author, both part-time advocates against sugar. They write articles and do other work for Sugar Science, a group devoted to educating the public about sugar's health dangers. Quote, it's shown me that conflicts of interest are not only financial, but also intellectual, said Lane, who added disclosures about the author's sugar science affiliations to the editorial after a reader brought them to her attention, she says. So here we have Dr. Christine Lane essentially echoing what Dr. Maya Jack from the American Beverage Association uh, had uh, claimed uh, undermined our previous systematic review as our having an intellectual conflict of interest that is equal in importance to a financial conflict of interest. Now, what is sugar science? Does that represent an intellectual conflict of interest? Sugar science is an educational website sponsored by the University of California in San Francisco, founded by Dr. Laura Schmidt, from whom you spoke earlier. It is an authoritative source for the scientific evidence about sugar and its impact on health. It is a repository of studies that asked the question of the relationship between added sugar and disease outcomes. It is entirely an academic exercise. There is no industry funding. 
Uh, its purpose is to educate the public. I have written a grand total of one blog for the Sugar Science website. That was the entirety of this claim of an intellectual conflict of interest at this, uh, at this juncture. So uh, by way of conclusions and by way of actually asking questions rather than making recommendations, because I know tomorrow's uh, session is entirely about recommendations, I would conclude that industry has a track record of unfavorably influencing science in multiple insidious ways. But the beverage industry has demonstrated a unique ability to manipulate the scientific process and shape what is considered to be scientific, quote unquote, fact or scientifically controversial. The scientific and the policymaking communities must continue to be vigilant in defense of the pursuit of truth about the effects of financial conflicts of interest. And by way of questions, I would ask, should journals not only require conflict of interest disclosures, but should we also ensure that critical reviews of the original research is made by people who have expertise in assessing conflicts of interest? The amount of work that we had to do to review that, that systematic review funded by ILSI was about a three, four hour um, affair. So it's no small task, but it is not terribly different from having a biostatistical review, which Annals of Internal Medicine always requires for any of its papers. Should editors' performance be assessed with respect to their track record around conflicts of interest? Is it acceptable that Dr. Christine Lane would accept for publication that ILSI review and not only that, accept and publish a subsequent exact mirror image of that systematic review talking about the effects of eating red meat, which again found that public health guidelines around limiting red meat were funded on junk science about one year later. Next, how can we prevent the so-called intellectual conflicts of interest construct from being used to undermine science. Here, I would actually disagree with my colleague, Adrian Hernandez, who uh, described these non-financial conflicts of interest as being uh, as important as financial conflicts of interest. And uh, I believe that this is a, a very dangerous territory, as Dr. Barrow pointed out in her introductory comments. And non-financial conflicts of interest now are recommended to be assessed by the uh, ICJME, the International Committee of the Journals of Medical Editors, and this construct really needs to be carefully fleshed out. Uh, when is it appropriate for journals to take a stance against publishing science funded by industries with an established track record of manipulating the scientific process to promote their bottom lines while they simultaneously undermine public health? Briggs et al. in the American Journal of Public Health review the state of the art with respect to journals prohibiting publications uh, by scientists who are funded by the tobacco industry? Should we generalize those kinds of policies for an industry that has uh, so clearly demonstrated its ability to manipulate the scientific process? And finally, how can we carefully educate the media about the potential effects of conflicts of interest on science on the one hand, while also trying to promote a sense of public trust in science. It's a very delicate balance. So with that, I'll, I'll again thank uh, the National Academy for inviting me uh, to tell my story today. And I guess it's time for our discussion.